All right. Good day. Good morning. Good afternoon. Hello, everybody. This is Lars Light. And on behalf of the Psalm Journal, the Psalm Foundation, and National Geographic, publishers of the New South Wales Wine Encyclopedia, I'd like to welcome you to our Winery Close-Ups educational series. Today's theme is a state of mind. Uh, we're talking about fruit from an exceptional source, and we have six exceptional winemakers to talk to us about their great fruit. Uh, then I want to also remind you that this is being recorded. It's on Facebook Live, and the recording will be available on psalmjournal.com as well as psalmfoundation.com website. Uh, there will be a printed recap in the October-November issue of the Psalm Journal, so be sure to tune into that to get your copy. And um, there's also a chance not only to get some great education, but also to get some funding to help you further your education and your advancement uh, in the Guild and in your, in your studies. And we have with us Lynn Fletcher from the Psalm Foundation, who's going to tell us about some of the incentives and some of the opportunities you have to uh, uh, and even more reason to pay some attention today. Lynn, welcome. Thank you, Lars. Uh, so first we wanna say thank you so much to the Psalm Journal and all of our participating wineries for making this program possible today. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so within the next 24 hours, we're first gonna do a random drawing and eight of the participants on the session today are gonna receive one year's access to the Psalm Geo program built by Greg Van Wagner. And you will be notified if you're one of those recipients very soon. Uh, secondly, we have an essay competition. So um, within the next day or two, everybody on this session will receive a prompt via email with the question. You'll have until August um, 17th to submit your essay responses. And the top two winners will receive a copy of the new Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia. And first place is going to win a check for $400 from Psalm Foundation. So make sure you pay close attention today and enjoy the webinar. And I'll hand it back to Lars. Thank you very much, Lynn. Appreciate that. What great opportunities you guys have. Um, so today we're talking about essentially the sourcing of grapes, which is the building block in winemaking. Uh, exceptional places will give you supreme quality. It's sort of a holy grail to the, many a winemaker, and it is the start on their mission toward excellence. Uh, I personally have a philosophy that I think that today we're very fortunate. We're living in a sort of golden age of wine that you can get good wines anywhere in the world. Simple, easy drinking wines can be made anywhere in the world and you can enjoy. There's no reason you can't get a simple table wine to have. But what is it that makes a wine sh worthy of being shipped around the world? It's a wine that has a truly exceptional sense of place, a wine that is really worthy, a wine that is unique uh, and, and speaks of only one place on this planet Earth. And speaking of planet Earth, we also have with us Sam Geo, uh, which is what I like to call the, where Google Maps meets uh, wine country. And we have the mastermind behind it, Greg Van Wagner, a uh, longtime Psalm at Jimmy's, and uh, the man who developed Psalm Geo. And Greg is going to give us a little bit of an overview and then uh, come back to uh, with each producer to, uh, to talk about what corner of the world we're visiting. So, Greg, welcome. Thank you so much, Lars. It's great to be here and, uh, you know, really talk about all these great producers and great estates that are that are with us. And uh, with that, I'll take you over to the to the Psalm Geo tour and this is an example of a, this is tour is a, basically an example of a much larger program that covers the entire world, has a ton of wine theory, uh, has a lot of classic maps and uh, quite a bit of other things to check out all over the world. Um, but today we're talking about estates. And uh, one thing that I think is truly amazing about estate wines when so many wines are sourced from, you know, different vineyards around that the producer doesn't necessarily own, there's really no replacement for owning your own vineyards. When you get to decide uh, where the grape, what happens to the grapes, how you work them from the very beginning. And we'll go all over the world today. We'll start in California, north of San Francisco with uh, Mendocino, Rotor State, then head over to Napa, Silverado Vineyards. Then we'll head uh, down the coast to Paso Robles. Uh, we have Jay Lower and Patrimony. Then we'll head down to South America. Uh, we'll head to Mendoza at the base of the Andes Mountains. We'll do Zolo and a number of their uh, state vineyards there. And then we'll cross the Atlantic Ocean and head up towards Banffy in Piedmont, Italy. But now first we're gonna start in Mendocino County, um, truly incredible area that really has a reputation for Burgundy varieties. Uh, 
Yeah, as you can see, this is so close to the coast here. And so it gets so much um, cooling effect from the Pacific Ocean. Region one on the Winkler index and often seeing 50 degree and 40 degree diurnal temperature shifts. I mean, you can see we are what, maybe eight miles from the Pacific here. So you get a lot of that really great cooling effect. And, you know, the Anderson Valley is one place that is really always focused on uh, biodynamic and organic wines, which is incredible to see. And so we head down to Rotorua State. Uh, they have 600 acres of owned vineyards, which I think is really, truly incredible. Uh, it's among the very few American sparkling wine houses uh, that can source from all estate fruit. And this is the northern outpost of uh, Champagne Louis Rotor. So obviously a ton of, uh, of, of winemaking smarts in the cellar as well. And with that, uh, I'll hand it back to Lars. But first, we're going to check out this uh, beautiful shot of the Rotor estate. Nice. It's gorgeous. gorgeous. Thank you very much, Greg. So with us today, we have Arnold Weyrich, who is the Senior Vice President and Winemaker for Rotorua Estate. He graduated from the, pre, uh, the prestigious Montpellier School with his Master's in Viticulture and Enology. And ironically enough, he began as an intern almost 30 years ago at Rotorua Estate. Uh, he returned to France to pursue his career uh, and raise a family. And he came back to Rotor in 2020 and also worked at their cellars in Reims. Uh, and now manages the all aspects of the Rotor Estate. So Arnaud, welcome. It's great to have you here. Thank you to uh, to you guys. Thank you to Sam Journal and Greg and and Lars, of course. You know to uh, welcome Rotor Estate to uh, to the show. So I know I am on a on a schedule. So I'm <laughs> I'm gonna start sharing my screen and I have you know some slides that I wanna you know uh, show you, you know uh, obviously. All right, here we go. Great. All right. So uh, I think you know the one of the um, the thing that you know we want to say about Rotor Estate is like you know we we think you know as being the, the benchmark of the, the California you know, sparkling wine, and why you know we believe you know this is you know uh, uh, um, this is true. So I'm just gonna whoops. All right, here we go. Uh, as you know, uh, Greg said we are Northern California, so we are very close to the Pacific Ocean. We are about you know uh, 11 miles as the crow flies to the uh, to Pacific Ocean. We are definitely a cool climate. Uh, Northern California, which is very funny because in fact, you no, know, we are at the latitude of 39 and North, which is the latitude of the south of Spain, Portugal, south of Spain, thinks uh, maybe, you know, Valencia, which is not obviously, you know, the place where you do, uh, you grow no, no, uh, no acid driven sparkling wine, but because of the proximity of the ocean, which is a very cool, huge mass of cold water, allows for the fog to come in and cool down the Anderson Valley. So this is a picture taken from the ridge from above. This is about 700 feet looking down into the Anderson Valley. And in the morning, you get the fog to roll in and stays during the night, most of the night. And then it cools down you no, know, pretty much you know, the, the bottom you know, part of the valley. So um, it is fairly easy to get those misty, cool morning on the valley floor. And as you said earlier, that proximity of the ocean you know, creates also something that is very well suited for the northern uh, varieties uh, like Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Gewürztraminer, Miller, uh, Riesling, Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc. Um, so why did the family uh, and the, the family that owns Louis Rodai and Rodai Estate you know, pick the Anderson Valley? Well, they thought there was something very interesting about it, which was uh, it was a wet area, but it had you know, a wet season from you know, usually October to May, and then it's a dry season. So you have enough water to grow your grapes, also enough water to, for frost protection, because this is a spring frost area because of the low attitude. Um, they like you know, the place also because the uh, average yearly temperature is around 53 Fahrenheit when Champagne is around 52 Fahrenheit. So not cold winters, but a lot of those diurnal swing between night and day of up to 50 Fahrenheit. The Anderson Valley is a fairly small uh, area. It's only 2,500 acres. We own uh, 620 acres of, uh, of estate vineyard in the Anderson Valley. The soil types, this is not champagne. There's no limestone. Uh, there's no high calcium content soil. In fact, we're pretty much on the acidic spectrum of the soil. So the type of rootstock that do thrive around here are more the burgundy rootstocks rather than the typical champagne rootstock. 
Uh, in fact, you have to bring a little bit of no, uh, lime to uh, bring your pH back into uh, the good zone. Uh, most of the soil are weathered sandstone and mudstone. And one of the, uh, the soil type that's you know, well known, it's called the bare wallow type of you no know, soil types. And this is weathered sandstone. It, there's some good you know, uh, soil uh, uh, water holding capacity, but it drains fairly well. So it's pretty well suited for Pinot Noir where it doesn't want to get its wet feet for too long. So fairly draining soil at the same time, enough water holding capacity to go through that uh, season, the dry season during the, uh, the summer. Um, so something that is very geeky is what we've, I've looked at many years ago is, you know, what's the, uh, uh, the fog pattern? What does it create you know, in the Anderson Valley? It's a narrow band that's pretty long, or 15 miles long, you no know, valley, but it's pretty narrow. And then you can get closer to the ocean. So Navarro is you know, a little town on the west side of the valley. It's about 13 miles you know, from the ocean. Philo is about the middle you know, of the valley. It's about 18 miles. And Boonville is the further east, about 22 miles from the ocean. So Remember, blue is closer to the ocean, yellow is the further away you know, uh, from the ocean. Here, here what it does on the graph when you look at the fog. So here, this is the relative humidity. So blue, again, is the closest to the ocean. So you know, this was you know, a recording of the three weather station back in July of 2017. If you're closer to the ocean, you get fog fairly you know, early in the morning, 2 AM, you get 100% relative humidity, you are condensation. It is, fog is building up. If you're further east, which is the yellow line, it takes a little longer to get the fog to build up, but it happens towards the early morning. And as you know, sun rises, suddenly that relative humidity drops into something that's in the, the 50%. And then you see that, you know, that blue line, the close to the ocean builds up fairly early on as well. So if you're closer to the ocean, the fog comes early, leaves no later and then builds up early again in the day. What's interesting is the, uh, uh, um, the temperature. So you see that the blue line again, the temperature drops fairly around, but doesn't drop as much. The fog has a blanket. So it you knows kind of stops the temperature to drop too far. If you're further in the valley, which is, you know, uh, a Philo or Boonville, there's less fog. The temperature drops really quickly. It can go down, for example, on that night of July, as low as 43 and a half Fahrenheit, when during the max of the day, it came up to 91 Fahrenheit. And then it was not a, any, it was not a specific night. It happens that a, a lot of times. So 50 Fahrenheit, 48 Fahrenheit temperature swing, what it does, it, you know, uh, when those nights are cool enough like that, what it does, it retains the acidity. So the, uh, the malic acid and the tartaric acid are not burned by the vines. Actually, below 50 Fahrenheit, not much happens. Um, warm nights tends to burn the acid you know, uh, uh, in, in, in the grapes, which is then not very good if you're trying to make high acid, crisp, you know, beautiful, you no know, sparkling wine. Um, back to who we are, yeah, 620 acres of vineyard, or it's 100% estate grown grapes. Pinot Noir and Chardonnay only. We recall that 100% Anderson Valley Terroir, which is at proximity to the ocean. We also have some organic grapes, about 100 acres now organic, uh, farm organic, and at 30 now biodynamic. 100% fish friendly, you uh, know, uh, farming certified. You know, there is one river, the Navarro River, that is home to the steelhead, no trout. You know, if you farm and then silt goes down to the river you not only lose your topsoil, which is not good as a farmer, you also kill the fish. So we pay a lot of attention to this. We are totally under the influence of the Champagne Rio Rotter, you know, uh, and as we were established in 1982, which is, you know, as my background picture on that picture, you know, we use a lot of reserve wines made from the previous uh, you know, uh, vintages that we hold on average for four years. Because those whites uh, of uh, Chardonnay and Pinot Noir have that beauty of being able, very age worthy, a lot of acid core, you know, that's you know, high malic, but not too high. That good acid level makes those wines to be very age worthy. And that's how you make you know, a long uh, lasting age you know, uh, quality of a sparkling wine. Um, we make uh, uh, obviously you know, a, a range of wines, you know, the, the brute, uh, really said brute, multi vintage, mostly driven by Chardonnay, a Roto Estate, Rose, multi vintage, they're both. You know, uh, uh, have a little bit of reserve wine of a few, uh, about 10% of reserve wine um, in the blend. And there is also the vintage cuvee of Roller Estate, it's called L'Hermitage. 
And the current vintage release is the 2013. The very soon to be released is the 2015 before the end of this year. And also make a very uh, uh, you know, small amount of Lermitage Rosé. It's currently the vintage 2012. Need a balance of 50-50 in Pinot Noir and Chardonnay. Very little bit of reserve wine, only 4%. So it really know, respects a lot about the character of the place, but of the character of the vintage. And uh, for those of you who have tasted you know, the, uh, the Lermitage before, that's a wine that you know, you know, is aged on average five years on the yeast. So if you have a good acidity, that yeast autolysis you know, is that nice you know, wrapping around that frame of crispness you know, from, from, from the acid of the wine. So one dissolves those nutty aromas. It's not only a wine that you can enjoy you know, as a starter wine, like you know, I'm the starter speaker, right? So what, you know, I guess you know, was something, you know, was the message here you know, about you know, you know, having a sparkling wine like that. It's a good message. For, or no, I would say I'm, I'm, I'm one of those people that are very fortunate to be enjoying your 2013 Lemitage right now. Uh, I would also call it like your estate. I would call it fish friendly as well. Uh, it's got a beautiful vein of acidity, but at the same time, there's a real creamy mouthfeel to it. Nice round fruit. It's a delicious wine for an amazing 2013. How long is it on the lease? This is you know, five and a half years on the lease. And in fact, you no, know, for the geeky ones, you know, in fact, all of my wines, when I disgorge them, actually print on the back of the bottle. You know, it's printed the disgorging date. So obviously, if it's a non-vintage wine, it just tells you when it has been disgorged and has been on the cork. It's something that is very quality driven. That's something I learned from working with the family. You know, the Rodin family is actually you want to be paying attention to a lot of details. And one of those details is when you disgorge the wine, the time the one spends on the cork before it is released is actually a, de a decision. So, you know, awesome. luxury is given time to time. So, yes. disgorging the wine, holding the wine, and then releasing it after five to six months on the cork after disgorging is a part of the quality feature of a nicely made sparkling wine. And I wish we had the luxury of more time to <laughs> hear your presentation, but unfortunately, that's it for time. Uh, so, thank you. That was fascinating. It was beautiful. Um, I, as a New Yorker, I thank you for the very um, full elevator pitch. So uh, next up, we have Russ Weiss, who is uh, back again. Russ is a frequent visitor on our series. Uh, Russ is president of Silverado Vineyards. He also oversees all operations of this family-owned winery. Russ grew up in a California farming family, taught English and literature in Japan, uh, returned to California starting out as a winery tour guide, and worked his way up the ranks at several leading wineries before joining Silverado in 2004. Uh, he's also former chairman of the Stags Leaf District Association, so he knows a thing or two about exceptional growing sites. Russ, welcome back. Great to see you, Lars. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for the Psalm Journal um, organizing this, and, and obviously um, awesome to be working with Psalm Geo uh, with, with Greg. Uh, man, I don't have to, how do I follow Arnaud? I, I, those are just such delicious wines up there. It makes me want to hop in the car and head north. Right. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, I, I, I'm, I'm privileged enough to talk about one of the, the truly special areas in uh, Napa and also one of the truly special vineyard sites there. Uh, I think I think most of everybody knows that we've, you know, we've uh, been um, uh, working, Silverado has been working um, in uh, the Napa Valley for quite some time. We, our first vineyard, we, the family purchased in, in 1976. And over the years, uh, we've, we've collected an estate of uh, six vineyards. Uh, we're going to focus a lot on the one at the very top left of your screen, the Mount George Vineyard, which um, was first planted to vinifera in 1868. So it makes it one of the oldest uh, plantings of vinifera in the Napa Valley and the oldest in our little baby Appalachian. Uh, in 2012, uh, the Coombsville AVA was finally uh, designated and, and obviously we were uh, quite privileged uh, to be part of that uh, committee that, that submitted all the information to uh, the TTB. Um, it's, it's a fascinating appellation because um, <clears throat> I'm glad Arno sort of gave a little bit of a description of, um, you know, how the Bay and how the Pacific really influence um, temperatures. And I think everybody knows that that's, that's quite true for Napa, not only coming in from the north from the, uh, the Chalk Hill Gap, but also all of the areas like Carneros and like Coombsville, which sit down on the San Francisco Bay, which keeps our 
winter is a little bit more moderate and keeps our summers uh, quite a bit cooler because of that fantastic exposition Arno did on fog. We are all of our vineyards, but especially the Mount George one is under the fog line in spite of being up on the, on the slopes of Mount George. Um, at rainfall, about half of, I was very jealous when, when Arno gave the, the, that rainfall figure. <laughs> we get about half of that. And of course, uh, we're, we're at the third year of a drought here. So we've had, we've had much less than that. Um, on my last check, it was about a month ago. I think we'd had eight, eight inches uh, here in Napa. So it's been, it's been challenging, very challenging. But one of the things about uh, Coombsville is that uh, it's been influenced by Mount George, which you see here in the background. Uh, Mount George didn't blow up as a, as, a, as a volcano to form a caldera. What it did instead is it, it did something called an igneous leak. So it, the, the pressure of the volcano pushed soils down and out away from, uh, away from the crest of the hill. And one of those uh, soil types is this, uh, this tufa that you can see, it looks like a rock, but you can just crumble it in your hands. You can just break it in your hands. So it's, it's this chalky, um, immature um, uh, volcanic material. And, and all around Mount George, uh, Mount George and all around Coombsville, uh, you've got this soil type, which is really unusual for Napa. You know, I think many of you know that Napa has half the world's soil orders. There are about 100 different soil types in Napa. So Napa is an absolute tiramisu of fabulous soils to work with. But one of the lovely things about Coombsville is it's quite monolithic. It has this Coombsville gravelly loam. It's one of the reasons that we were able to achieve the Appalachian is because of this, this very consistent and... and um, and sort of ubiquitous soil type all around, uh, all around that sort of tilted up horseshoe that is Coombsville. And what that does for us is that, that you know, what you're looking at is surface stuff that kind of crumbles up to the top, but um, 15, 20, 25 feet below the surface, you have these huge chunks of this, of this tufa. And even in, a, even in a very light rain, rainy season like ours, uh, the rain will go right down through the gravel that, that's on the surface and collect in this chalky, in these ch chalky chunks of soil. And the vines are able to go down and tap into that and find a source, a consistent source of water um, throughout, throughout the growing season, which is why it's one of the oldest places in Napa Valley to grow grapes, because it was one of those funny little areas where even there, there's not a lot of rainfall, uh, you could dry farm obviously in the, you know, in the 19th century. So uh, it's, a, it's, an, a, it's a fantastic area for that. And, and our homage to that is geo quite, quite, uh, quite appropriately for today's, today's uh, seminar. Uh, geo is our little pun. It's a, it's a nickname for George, obviously. But uh, as Greg can tell you, it's, you know, geography, geology. Um, and, uh, and so it's really honoring the, the, the mountain and the soils that come from come from that, uh, that, that mountain. And, and in terms of the wine, um, you, you know, the, what, what we love about it is it's a, it's a, it's a quite a cool area. As we said, we have a, a long morphology of, of the phenolics uh, throughout the growing season, which ends up meaning that we've got um, really tremendous um, tannin evolution and, and complex phenol evolution at slightly lower pHs than, than you'd get further up in the valley where, where it's warmer. And so we're consistently sort of landing around three fives, three sixes uh, in terms of pH. There's a lot of vibrant acidity. We're, we're, we're always landing somewhere around, you know, five sevens, five, five eights in total, total uh, TAs, uh, which means you have this really broad, chewy texture to the wine, but this lovely uh, finish that carries those, those, those sort of brambly black fruit and and stone fruit qualities of that that are so classic of, of Coombsville. Thank you, Russ. I got to tell you, I got so carried away uh, in enjoying your wine and our nodes wine that I forgot to uh, to cue Greg to give us the overview of where you're at. Well, it's uh, perfect. I've given the complete introduction to Greg. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> we're, we're nothing else. We can uh, we can do this on the fly. So, Greg, why don't you show us where we just were? What? What what uh, what Russ had to tell us? 
Absolutely. So yes, we we're in the uh, in the Napa Valley, just to the north of San Francisco and and Oakland. And um, I think this is really great. We're headed uh, straight to Coombsville, but you know Napa definitely you know one of the origins of uh, American wine, as well as such you know definitely the most internationally recognized region of uh, of America. We have the San Pablo Bay here. And then headed over to Coombsville, I think it's great that we saw the uh, photos because now you can really see Mount George here in the background. Um, again, we are very early in on the valley. So we are by Carneros and Oak Knoll. Um, and I've been just incredibly impressed with the, uh, with the wines coming out of Coombsville lately. Uh, I love the Cabernets grown, grown there and uh, uh, definitely a big fan. So we are just where you see where you see Greg's notation uh, about the, the oh you, oh you got us you got us yeah where you see Greg's notation where the country club is you can just see right above that where the road kind of turns there above that point where the road turns uh, is exactly what our vineyard is and kind of two sections there you can see a river running through the, the very middle of it or a little creek runs. running through the very middle of it a river runs through it wasn't that a river runs through it. There you go. Perfect. That is the ideal view. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Then we go over to the, uh, uh, the winery over in the Stags Leap district. Uh, they have just an incredible winery on, on the top of the hill here. Um, and here we have the, uh, the, the other view of Silverado Vineyards. Mount George at sunset. Exactly. Really beautiful with that. Yeah. Back to Lars. All right. Now I, I got to say, Russ, I'm, I'm, Again, I hate to tease anybody who doesn't have the wine in front of them, but I'm enjoying your 17 Geo, and the aromatics are incredible. I opened the bottle about 45 minutes ago, and the aromatics are just really impressive, showing very, very nicely. So yeah, I mean, it's just it's such a lovely spot. It may, that vineyard makes us really look like geniuses, and I think that's that's really the point of this seminar is when you find these spots. I mean, and we're and we're very cognizant of that. I mean, it, you know, Henry Hagen, you know, planted this to vinifer, as I said, you know. 1860s and and you know he he had real aspirations to make you know classic you know cabernet there and 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 in fact did and was widely recognized as a great cabernet way before we are and and so you you just have to honor that site and be really cognizant when you're working it that we are just custodians of a, of a beautiful site that that we need to hand you know to the next generation in better shape than than we got it well well said and well done Thank you, Russ. So I'm not going to miss my cue this time, Greg. Where are we heading next? You're on mute. There we go. We are headed down the coast of California. We are going to uh, Paso Robles. Um, and Paso Robles, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon is over 40% of the vineyard acreage. Uh, even if, you know, uh, a lot of times some People may think, okay, Paso is uh, a lot about Rhone varieties, uh, when really Cabernet is, uh, is really one of the benchmarks of the region. And when we're looking at Paso, uh, we are just south of Monterey and just in from the Santa Lucia range. Um, typically and basically always very much so cooler on the western side, and it gets warmer as you, as you head to the east. Uh, basically, the, the cool winds come in from the Pacific Ocean. They're driven up by the Santa Lucia Range, uh, where they form rainfall, most of which which occurs in the winter. And so the west side, no matter, matter how you dice it, is uh, cooler and rainier than the east side. And uh, that, that's why you can see these 11 AVAs uh, set out here. Here we have El Pomar District, uh, home of the Shotwell Vineyard, uh, main component of the Hilltops Blend. Uh, it's pretty cool for Cab. This is region two on the Winkler Index. And Jay Lohr here, they own 2,600 acres in Paso and has made sustainability really a prime focus and, uh, you know, has vineyards with these 50 degree temperature changes that really, uh, really help the wine quite a bit. With that, I'm excited to hear more. Awesome. Thank you, Greg. So we have Steve Carter, who was the regional winemaker for Jay Lohr. Uh, Steve graduated with his degree in viticulture from UC Davis and then moved down to New Zealand uh, to start his own vineyard and also worked as a grower's representative down there. He returned to California in 1989, 
I started at J. Lore as a viticulturist for uh, vineyards in Monterey and Sacramento, and now he is vineyard manager focusing on the Paso property. So Steve, welcome. I'm glad to be here. Thank you very much. I do want to make a correction there. I have never been confused as a winemaker. <laughs> I can, you can tell that because uh, for today's uh, program, our HR department only allowed me to taste a split. I'm not a professional <laughs> drinker. So anyway, All let right. me share my screen here. Thank you for correcting it. There we go. Well, I appreciate uh, Greg's introduction. He actually uh, could have just about given my, my talk today, but I'll go ahead and flesh out some of the points that uh, he made um, in that good introduction. So for a brief history of uh, J. Lohr wines, uh, Jerry Lohr planted his first grapes uh, in the Monterey County, actually in the early 70s. We're coming up just about to our 50, uh, 50 year anniversary. And these vineyards included a great number of uh, wine grape varieties, um, most, many of which are still grown there, uh, including Pinot Noir, Chardonnay, Riesling. But unfortunately, the Bordeaux varieties that uh, he planted uh, did not fare so well. The climate was just a little too cool to uh, get good ripeness. So Jerry started looking around the state um, for a more suitable site to grow red wine grapes. And after buying grapes and wine from different parts of the state, he actually settled in Paso Robles in the 80s uh, and so began his mantra of ripe grapes in the right place. And I joined Jerry in 1989 um, as a viticulturist for the winery. And at that time, we had about 120 acres of Cabernet Sauvignon planted here in Paso Robles. We've uh, since grown, uh, as Greg said, to, to farm over 20 times that number of acres. And they're almost exclusively red wine grapes, except we do have a small acreage of um, some white grown varietals that are planted on a vineyard that is the most westernmost in the, in the AVA. And uh, um, as Greg said, uh, the Paso AVA is a very large AVA. It's uh, the largest in, in California. And we have vineyards stretching from north to south. And the northernmost regions are the warmest and the southern uh, areas are the coolest. And we're gonna talk about the Shotwell uh, Vineyard, which is in, in that cooler uh, El Pomar region. Um, when having uh, vineyards planted in the area has given us um, two good benefits. One is the diversity of the fruit, fruit characteristics within a variety, and two, it helps us with logistics uh, at harvest time, as all the fruit of one variety isn't ripe at the same time. So it has two benefits. So there we go. That shows uh, the Paso Robles AVA and gives you an idea of where, the, uh, where our vineyards are located. And our uh, hilltop wine, that we're tasting, you're tasting today, it grew up from an observation that we made early on that the vines that were growing on the knolls of the vineyard uh, produced less fruit, but it was more deeply colored and possessed more intense and dense fruit character. And it was just a matter of identifying which areas to pick separately at harvest and that wine was born. And you think about it from a farming standpoint, you know, thousands of years of erosion on the ridges lead to thinner soils and lower fertility. And in Paso Robles, you can add the fact that our soils are deemed here highly erodible with low permeability in general. So for instance, during this past rainy season, which I also was very uh, envious when I heard Arnold <laughs> speaking of, you know, the number of inches of rain they can get in the North Coast. But in the last rain season, uh, the bulk of our rainfall fell in two episodes and that generated a lot of runoff. And so those ridges and uh, knolls of the vineyard did not have time for you know the moisture to soak in properly. So now you have vines growing in soils which are not deep or not overly fertile and start the season with less stored soil moisture. So naturally these uh, vines won't grow as vigorously as their as their brethren down the slope and will produce less crop with mo more open canopies. That's just what we're looking for to produce a special wine. 
And one of the last things to note about the Hilltop wine is if you can compare the phenolic profile of our estates wine, Seven Oaks today, you'll see that it's the same caliber as our Hilltop wine was 15 years ago. There's a difference in cooperage in the Hilltop in that we use French oak and you know 60% maybe new oak every year compared to Seven Oaks, which will be American oak and maybe 20%. Um, but the quality advances that we've made in both wines are you know, due to adding these new properties, new clones and rootstocks, which have been available, and the gains we've made in knowing how to better farm our grapes through you know, the, the trials and errors that Mother Nature has given us over the years. So let's turn our attention to the Shotwell Vineyard. Um, the Shotwell Vineyard became available about eight years ago, and it's right next door to a, a Creston Road vineyard that we planted in the year 2000. And that Creston Road vineyard is planted in this El Pomar district, which has traditionally been known as the Merlot area of Paso Robles. Um, and so when we planted that Creston Road vineyard, it was uh, predominantly Merlot with Cabernet Franc and Malbec. Um, so looking at Shotwell, and knowing it's a region two, we were thinking that um, this would be an area where we could extend that harvest, but also get a denser, uh, more phenolic wine to form the base of our, of our hilltop wine. So this area, as Greg explained, lies just east of the Templeton Gap. And the Templeton Gap is kind of the air conditioner for the Paso Robles uh, AVA. On a warm summer's day in Paso, uh, the area warms up the latest and cools down the earliest. And so it leads to that, the lower total heat summation. Um, our rationale for planting caber cabernet on the shot will revolve around our desire for fruit with a denser tannin structure but we planted on an eight by four, so very uh, close vine spacing. We used invigorating div rootstocks, so uh, Riparia, uh, Fracal, um, 10114 to advance maturity because we knew that getting to that ripeness every year was going to be a challenge. And some of the newer on top clones, like clone 169, you know, further control the amount of fruit on each vine. This gives you an idea of actually being on the Shotwell Vineyard and looking across um, to that original Creston Road Vineyard. The predominant soil types here are Linnaic Cololo complex. It's, it's uh, a soil that's found throughout the Paso Robles AVA, and it's on 9 to 30% to slopes, as you can see from the picture. Um, it's a clay loam soil. It's pretty easy to farm. It was formed from weathered calcareous shale and sandstone. And it has probably the calcium carbonate content of right around uh, 5 to 10%. These soils are very well drained, um, but they're very shallow to very shallow, depending where you are on the slope. But fortunately, you know, with vines, which are deep rooted once established, um, so in years that we receive an adequate rainfall, uh, very little irrigation is needed to produce a crop. Um, this gives you an idea of what uh, the soil looks like. Um, the actual shale is not, calcare is not uh, calcareous, but the base soil is. Uh, this is a view here, and along with the majority of Cabernet that's planted on this vineyard, we do have some Malbec. This is looking at that portion of the vineyard. And that Malbec also goes in uh, to the uh, hilltop wine, usually, you know, three to 5% every year. Cool. And again, Steve, I wish, I wish we had the luxury of more time. Uh, to oh, that's good. I, I'm out. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect timing. I have to say, I'm again, not to make anybody jealous, but I'm enjoying sipping your, your 2018 Hilltop. And I find it's got incredibly unctuous fruit uh, and yet a lot of spice box character to it. Uh, and now you just said you're not a winemaker, clearly, but you are an agronomist. You are a vineyard manager. 
Uh, how much of that do you credit to what's coming from the soil and the vine as opposed to what's going on in the winery? Uh, well, I give our winemakers a ton of credit. We have a very <laughs> talented team. Trust me, uh, I like, I also give them a lot of trouble. Um, but I would say that, you know, this particular vineyard makes up about 60% of the wine that you're tasting. And so we actually have another vineyard that's uh, a little bit higher elevation further uh, from the coast, but on the same similar soils. And it gives a little more red fruit character, but that deep house style of dense, but soft, that is derived from this vineyard. So Fantastic. Very, very nice. Beautiful wine. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Steve. Good growing. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Greg, what's, uh, where's our next stop as this bus heads south? Oh, Literally, right. not figuratively. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So uh, if I could, um, do you mind? It's, we're still on share screen here. Yep. Steve, would you mind coming off share screen? Yeah. Fortunately, we make wine. We bring people joy. We're not worried about saving there lives, so it's all good. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So yes, we're uh, we're actually continuing in uh, Paso Robles. Uh, we're headed a little bit west into the Adelaide district. Um, and yes, we have the Santa Lucia range just here, uh, the Templeton Gap, which, you know, is not really one specific place, but uh, a series of lower lying hills. And I think this, uh, this road that cuts through is probably the, uh, the most logical place to build a road. So that's probably uh, the lowest lying of the hills. And in the Adelaide district, you know, one thing that's interesting, we're on the west side, it's cooler here. Uh, but it's also much more mountainous and you have these very, very calcareous soils. Mm. Um, and Paso is very interesting in that there's, when you think about it, there's very few wine regions in America that have calcareous soils. Um, yeah. You know, you see, of course, a lot in France, but it's uh, not something that you commonly see in the States. And so we're on this Western side, you can actually see Dow Mountain uh, fairly prominent uh, feature on the landscape there, which is uh, actually where we're headed next. But the Dow brothers have quite an interesting story and have really put uh, a lot of work into this really impressive estate uh, that tops out over at 2,200 feet here. And yeah, really fun wines. Looking forward to checking them out. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right on top of that, Greg. I, I had the good fortune of being out in Paso in last October and fascinating the diversity of the of the microclimates there. You understand why it's Paso, but it's 11 different AVAs. Uh, so there's uniformity, but there's diversity and it's fascinating. So um, our next speaker is Eric Johnson, who is uh, unique as a former SOM. Um, came from the, the French Laundry, uh, was a wine buyer, and now he is the estate manager. At, uh, at Patrimony Estate. So it brings in a unique expected, um, uh, perspective that I think a lot of us can relate to. And uh, we have a little bit of a miracle to happen right now because uh, Greg is on a, I'm sorry, Eric is on a flight <laughs> somewhere over the West Coast at the moment. But through the miracle of Zoom, we're going to share screen and have his presentation come to us um, perfectly intact. And here it is, welcome. Eric Johnson. Thank you, Lars. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Sandra, for having us and including us in this wonderful presentation. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, appreciate all your support and interest. I'm excited to be able to sort of uh, briefly paint the picture of what it is that you're seeing in the background behind. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen now. I'm going to do a little presentation. I got a couple different slides that will. Um, really show off the vineyard and what it is that we're attempting to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're good there, Lars? We're great. <laughs> awesome. The patrimony is the uh, winery in Paso Robles. This is a uh, Bordeaux style house in the district of Adelaida over there on the west side. Uh, Legatum Nostrum is our legacy, so this is uh, legacy of George and Daniel, uh, the owners of our winery, uh, Daniel Dow being the 
fine maker as well. Uh, always impressive to me as someone who uh, actively participates in every facet of the company uh, and every facet of the business. And Daniel and George are certainly um, involved in every single decision and every single choice that is made. And as Daniel's vision as to why we're here in the first place. Uh, so this is the vineyard that we're speaking about. This is Dow Mountain. Uh, this is nestled in, uh, like I said, the west. Uh, western side of Paso Robles, 40 miles from the coast, uh, 2200 feet, up, which to me uh, was one of the most interesting and, and perplexing things that I, I heard, uh, but until finally having an opportunity to visit, uh, really started to make sense. You know, coming from the wine side and, and uh, restaurant side, the exposure to wines from around the world is really incredible, especially at the French Laundry. I think we had almost uh, 2800 different uh, selections. Um, you know, obviously focusing on, on California, but uh, France and Italy were uh, a big part of that uh, uh, wine list. And, you know, upon reading about all these vineyards in Europe and um, the uniqueness of some of these great vineyards that have withstood the test of time and, you know, have certainly uh, expanded themselves above the rest, our, our wines with a, a certain um, sense of place and wines that tell a story of where it is that they come from, uh, Vineyards that are at elevation, that have aspect, that have slope, uh, that are exposed to sun, that have big diurnal shifts, that have coastal influence. You know, as Daniel's sort of engineering background, that really got us to where we are today as he sort of operated on a first principle uh, situation and said, you know, what uh, could be the best wine in the world, not what should be. And he went on to research a lot of these great wines from uh, Europe and, and certainly here in California, and South America, and, and really sort of found that, you know, what it is that makes these, you know, sort of separate themselves is the terroir, you know, and terroir coming from the word terre, in French means earth, referring to both climate and soil, which are probably two of the most important parts of these particular vineyards. And so sitting here and, and looking at this vineyard, you have slope, you have aspect, you have uh, exposure to sun, and um, you have coastal influence from the Pacific. Uh, that really brings in that amazing breeze uh, and keeps the grapes nice and safe uh, during those afternoon heat waves in August. So here's the soil, and this is one of the things that was most impressive to me. Uh, this is calcareous clay, uh, which is a sedimentary soil. You know, oftentimes a lot of soils in California are volcanic or alluvial. Um, and in Europe, if you're in Bordeaux, if you're in Rome, if you're in Burgundy, if you're in Champagne, if you're in Tuscany, if you're in Austria, all of these soils are clay and limestone. Uh, clay obviously being really important because that gives you that decay, it gives you that satin flesh, and it gives you that color. And color is so important uh, because it gives you texture and texture gives you high density and high density gives you the opportunity to really um, give you that mouthfeel and that velvety sort of flavor with tannins. Uh, but the limestone is really what sets it apart from other places in California. This is uh, truly one of the most unique um, parts of, of um, California. Uh, this is a, a small stretch of plain limestone that's only found on the west side of Paso Robles and a little bit down in Santa Maria. Uh, but limestone is what gives you that minerality, it gives you that acid, it gives you that backbone, it gives you that balance from that really bright um, climate that we have here in Paso. But Paso is hot, you know, but where we are is not. And so this is a, a comparison of uh, days over 100. Uh, days over 100 is important because, you know, once you get reached that point, uh, often you can lose a lot of quality. Uh, you can lose your grapes to uh, evaporation of water, uh, dehydrated. You can sunburn the canopy. Um, you know, but on down mountain, even though it's in Paso, uh, in 2019, we didn't have, we had zero days over 100, which, you know, for me coming from Napa, Paso was always the hottest growing wine region in California. Uh, but on the west side, at elevation with that coastal breeze, uh, really is one of the most impressive and, and unique areas for growing Cabernet uh, because of the balance that you have not only in uh, the climate and in the temperature, but also with the soil as well. And so this is a new um, vineyard that we have. We just purchased uh, adjacent to Dow Mountain. This is a 270 acre ranch uh, that's facing south, which also a lot of really incredible uh, vineyards from around the world do. Uh, and so this is uh, going to be the next chapter in, in our legacy of, of something not only uh, of elevating the quality of Paso Robles and not only shining a light really bright on Adelaida, uh, but also taking these Cabernets in this Bordeaux 
uh, varietal and putting on the global stage. And so this is our pursuit into bringing Cabernet, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and Sauvignon Blanc and Semillon uh, from a, a place many people wouldn't um, expect and then over delivering on power, on flavor, on concentration, on color uh, and overall experience. So if you haven't had the opportunity to come and visit Paso, please reach out to us at any time. Reach out to Lars, reach out to myself. Thank you again to the Psalm Journal for uh, having us for this uh, wonderful discussion of uh, uniqueness and, and importance of vineyard and sense of place. Uh, we appreciate you shining a light on our little area of the United States. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Eric, wherever you are. <laughs> that was great. Uh, I always like to say that um, I think, the, you know, is he a former Psalm because he's, you know, no longer on floor service? Former Psalm is sort of like former or Marine. There's no such thing. <laughs> Marine's always a Marine. Psalm's always a Psalm. So, Greg, what's our next stop? We are headed down to Argentina. Uh, really exciting wine country right now. You know, I think this is really the best time to drink Argentinian wine. The, the quality has never been better. And there's a lot of there that are really doing some. All right. So can you still see me? Yep. You're on Perfect. my screen. Fantastic. Right. Oh, you just, uh, we just, uh, did we lose you, Greg? We lost you. We lost your presentation. Oh. Hmm. So if you want to share screen again, like I said, thank God we're not saving lives here. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. Are we back? All We're right. back. So here in, We're back. We are back in Luan de Coyo. Um, really interesting area where you can do wines uh, that have an amazing nuance. Uh, you can also do very, very powerful styles of wine. You're just here at the base of the Andes Mountains. And you can see, you know, Mendoza is not uh, a small area, which allows you to do really a lot of different wines depending on really where your state is. I mean, you can just measure from side to side, you know, that's what, 40, 41 kilometers. Um, so a big area. And so when you're looking at different estates, there's really, really a lot that, that you have that you can work with. And so we're headed down to a couple of the state, the estates of the Zolo Winery. El Jarillo, uh, one of their vineyard blocks, we are in Agrello over here. And then other vineyard blocks, Las Lamas, closer to the winery itself. Here we have Martina working in the vines. And uh, yeah, back to Lars and Martina to hear more. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Greg. And uh, I think Martina would agree with you about it being an exciting time to be in Argentina. Um, uh, Martina Galeana is the winemaker of Zolo. She was born in Mendoza, so she's sort of part of the terroir there. Uh, she got her enology degree right at home in Argentina, her master's in viticulture and enology at UC Davis. Uh, as and she was a Fulbright scholar to UC Davis, and she also interned in both San, uh, South Africa and Napa. So, Martina, welcome. It's great to have you. Uh, it's nice to see that. Is that a uh, a pretty live shot of snow on the Andes right now? Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, let me share my presentation. Great. There you go. I think. Everybody can see it. Yep, perfect. Okay, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation to, part for, to participate in this webinar. Uh, I'm really excited to show you the two vineyards that we have in Luján de Cuda. And well, first of all, just to show you a map of Argentina and kind of like locate everyone where we are. Um, we have four main wine regions in Argentina. We have the Cuda area where we have Mendoza, San Juan and La Rioja. Then we have the north, uh, where we have much higher altitude, and we're going to Salta, Jujuy, Tucumán, and Catamarca. And then we have uh, the south part, where we have the Atlantic area and Patagonia. In our case, for our company, uh, our company is, um, has actually three wineries, and we have vineyards in different places. We have in Patagonia, really close to the Atlantic Ocean. 
And then we also have in the Uco Valley and in Luján de Cuso and Maipú. But today I'm going to focus on, on Luján de Cuso, as I was saying, since the solo winery is the one that crushes area, grapes from this area. So as you can see, this is kind of like a, a more zoom in uh, map of Luján de Cuso, where we can divide Luján de Cuso into two main wine regions uh, that are divided by the Mendoza River that you see here, and you have the part that is above the Mendoza River, which is Las Compuertas, San Vistalba, where you have one of the oldest vineyards that you can find in Mendoza. And then the area below the Mendoza River, where you have Pedriel, Agrelo, and Garteche. And also, um, in terms of climate, Luján has um, an arid climate. We have very limited rainfall, less than 200 millimeters per year. So we are pretty much living in a desert. Um, we have really uh, high solar radiation because of the altitude there that we are. And as we go up, it's even higher. And the soils are typically alluvial soils, uh, just from all the rocks and all the particles that have come down from the Andes throughout the multiple years that these soils have been formed. Uh, this is just to kind of like give you from Mendoza, kind of like zooming in into where exactly our two vineyards are located. And here again, you have Lucan de Cudo and here are our two vineyards that are actually in Agrelo, and we have Finca Las Damas, which it is located at the bottom of the valley, and that's where our winery is located as well. And then Finca El Jarizal, that is a little bit more western in an area called Upper Agrelo, that this area is actually very close to the sierras that divide the Uco Valley from Luján de Cudo. So here you're going to have uh, a little bit higher altitude, a little bit more of a slope, and we're going to talk a little bit more in detail when we get to the, that vineyard. So now to talk about Finca Las Damas, uh, we have a total of 64 hectares planted. I'm going to focus on Cabernet because it's the wine that we are presenting today. Uh, we have a total of 13 hectares planted that we planted in 1998. Uh, we have two clones, clone seven and 337. Uh, it's mainly clone seven that we have planted, and the rootstock is 3309. Um, the trellis the system is a BSP system. Um, the altitude that we are is like 3,150 feet uh, above sea level. So we are already pre starting pretty high. And as I was saying, the winery is located in the same, in the same place as the vineyards are. And we, this is our biggest facility. We have approximately a little bit more than 2 million liters in capacity in stainless steel tanks and over uh, 30,000 uh, 30, liters in oak barrels. Um, this is just like to give you uh, a little more of a better idea of how the soils are formed. This is a soil pit of our Cabernet block. And the first 50 to 60 centimeters are, they are predominantly clay, uh, which means that we have a pretty um, important uh, water holding capacity in the first layers. And then as we get deeper, like the particle size, they become a little bit bigger. And there is a mix of like sandy loam salts with some rocks present as well, which helps getting a better drainage as we go deeper in the soil. Um, this is the solar reserve Cabernet Sauvignon that we make from this vineyard. Uh, in general, the wines from this area are wines that are really aromatic, um, that have a lot of breadfruit potential. They are juicy on the palate. They have really good structure and really double titanium. Um, so in general, they have a really, really nice character. Now moving on to Finca El Jarizal. Uh, this is... Um, we have 45 hectares planted and we have a little bit of uh, white varieties and red varieties. In the other one, we have pretty much all Bordeaux varieties planted. Uh, for Sauvignon Blanc, we have a massive selection of vines. Um, they are unrooted and they were planted in 2008. Um, as I was saying, this vineyard is a little bit higher. We are now are at 3,450 feet and you get a little bit more of a slope. We have a slope of 3%, which helps a lot with like air circulation, having our vines be really healthy, preventing like fungal diseases, and also preventing any kind of frost. 
uh, as we are at, with the other vineyard, we are more at the bottom of the valley. So they are, the air tends to like get stuck whenever it's cold. So in this vineyard, we are actually have no issue with frost at all. And for our Sauvignon Blanc, in general, we try to aim to, uh, whenever we're harvesting, we try to aim for three different harvest dates, kind of like based um, our decisions on the aromatics itself. So we try to do a really early harvest, kind of like to focus more on getting more of a green kind of character, kind of like peas or grass, and get a higher acidity and lower alcohol. And then we do a second one, kind of like looking more to citrus aromas, and a third one with like more tropical fruit, like pineapple and with passion fruit. Um, then the source of this um, uh, of this vineyard in particular, um, these are in general like in, they have much better drainage than um, the one in Las Damas. They are sandy loam soils uh, in the surface as well as we go deeper in the soil, and there is. Uh, or there are some raw pebbles that are mixed in the soil are all around the profile, which is super characteristic of alluvial soils. And this is like uh, the Sauvignon Blanc that I was telling about. This is one of our newest uh, products, which is Osmosis Sauvignon Blanc, which actually is a low alcohol wine. It has 9% alcohol. So we use um, a proprietary reverse osmosis technique to, to decrease the alcohol. And, we are really excited about this pro uh, this product. This is like uh, sugar free, uh, certified vegan, gluten free. So we are really excited to see how the consumer likes this product. So uh, really looking forward to that. It's definitely keeping in trend with consumer demand these days. So very well done, Martina. Thank you. Yep. All right. Appreciate that very much. Beautiful, uh, beautiful wines. Beautiful Argentina. So next up is Elizabeth Booth, who is a trade development director at Banfi, and she's going to talk to us about the Principessa Gavia estate in Piedmont. Elizabeth is also another SOM, uh, formerly wine director at Flagstaff House in Colorado, and as well as SOM at the Four Seasons in Denver. So Elizabeth, welcome. Great to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Go ahead and share my screen here. Great. All right, can everybody see that? Yep. Wonderful. So thank you all so much um, for tuning in today and giving me an opportunity to tell you a little bit more about Banfi Piemonte, the Gavi Zone, and of course our wine, um, Principesse Gavia Gavi. So I'm going to first start with just a brief introduction into who Banfi is as a company. We are a 100-year-old wine company in the third generation of family ownership. The second generation, John and Harry Mariani, purchased land in Piemonte in 1979, which is just a year after they made investments in Maltalcino. Uh, we do have property now throughout um, all of Tuscany, Maltalcino, Bulgari, uh, the Chianti zone, and now uh, throughout uh, Piemonte as well. They really saw the potential to make great uh, local Piemontese reds, sparkling wines, and of course, um, what brings us to our discussion today, uh, dry wines from Gavi. Hey, Elizabeth, I'm going to interrupt you for one second, because again, I missed my cue and I forgot to have Greg uh, bring us into your zone. So I'm going to just ask you to stop sharing screen for a moment. Uh, hold that point and Greg will give us the overview and then you can come back to tell sure. us more about Piedmont since you gave us an overview of Bonfi, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Greg. Absolutely. So yes, we're headed over to Italy, uh, more specifically Northern Italy, where, you know, the Alps kind of frame the, the great wine regions of Northern Italy. You can see uh, going in this semicircle over the top of Piedmont and Valle d'Aosta. We have France just off to the west. Uh, but the area we're focusing on is just north of Liguria. Um, Piedmont, of course, the classic uh, Italian wine region. We have uh, 44 DOCs and 18 DOCGs, uh, the famous red wines of Barolo and Barbaresco, uh, as well as Asti. And I mean, there's just so many, so many different classic wines of Piedmont. Uh, to me, I really love the, uh, the Gavi wines. 
they have this bright kind of almond and citrus tones and uh, are some of my favorite food friendly wines to, uh, to drink. Uh, Gavi, I've never traveled there. I really want to. Uh, hopefully this can uh, work for today to travel there, but beautiful winery and I hope to get there uh, when I do. You should, Greg. It's a pretty special part of the world. So thank you for your patience, Elizabeth. And now I'm going to let you uh, carry on with your focusing it on Piedmont. Thank you, Greg, for that. I appreciate it. Okay. okay. So um, I'm going to first start by giving a brief introduction into the history of, of Gavi um, and what makes it so interesting and why we're really able to create uh, tremendous wines from there. Um, so Banffy started making Gavi, sorry, my screen's moving a little slow. Banffy made our first vintage of Gavi in 1995, which was um, just about 20 years after the DOC was established. Uh, three years after our inaugural vintage, uh, Gavi was elevated to DOCG status. And really at that point, uh, it was one of the first Italian wines to gain uh, international success, especially here in the United States. At Banffy, we really were the pioneers to help elevate the wine to that level. And still today, we see about 85% of the Gavi market being exported. A quick little rundown on some of the regulations. Of course, Gavi is 100% Cortese grape. And it can be made in a variety of styles, still sparkling, spumante, and reserva, uh, still being the um, most common for sure, with minimum alcohol levels 10.5% for that, and then 11 for the reserva. So to really give you a lay of the land of Gavi, I think it's important to change how we think of um, what Gavi is. We know it's in Piedmont, but it's very different than its neighbors to the northwest of Asti and Alba, and especially Barolo and Barbaresco. Here, there's these beautiful rolling hills stretching um, from the north of Novi Liguri, which is where our wine, our vineyards are located, down towards the border of Liguria. Um, so here we have a lot of coastal influence. This region was actually part of the Genova, um, Genova many years ago, and it still has a lot of the cultural and climate um, influences from that. The vineyard area is, total vineyard area of Gavi is just over 1,500 hectares and a ranging elevation between 500 feet to 1,400 feet. So uh, quite a range here and really depends where you are in, in the part of the region um, for the elevation. And as I mentioned, quite different than other parts of Piemonte. The climate is, you could say, almost semi-Mediterranean um, with many different microclimates throughout due to the elevation changes in proximity to the sea in the Apennine mountain range. Um, and really that's what it is. It's the meeting of the Ligurian Sea and Apennine. There's cold winters. Um, frequently the most rainfall happens in fall into winter. And the summers are beautiful, warm, and that beautiful influence from the sea, we get um, great breezes throughout the vineyards. Uh, this whole area is located in the province of Alessandria. And for the, um, for the pr main production of great wine, um, we're looking at the areas of Gavi, Novi Liguri, which again is where Banffy's Vineyard is located, and Saravalli Scrivia. I love this map because I think it's a great representation of the different soils and little microclimates that we get throughout uh, the Gavi region. So starting in the north, um, in the Novi Liguri area, we have the ancient alluvial deposits mixed with gravel, and it's this really beautiful kind of red clay soils. And then moving south to what is really the heart of Gavi and the area of Gavi and where Gavi de Gavi is produced, we have an alluvial soil with mix of clay, sand, and silt. So you get a little bit um, of the benefits from everything there. And then further south, which is actually the highest elevations because again, you're um, at the foot of the Apennine mountain range, you have steeper terrain, white clay marls and the marine sediment influence from the sea, which um, from the heart of Gavi, the sea is only 40 kilometers. So really we're very close. And we um, can't talk about Gavi without talking about Cortese because this is the base of what makes our wines great from this area. Um, Cortese has um, documents dating back to the 17th century. 
and is native to the Monferrato Hills there. Um, it can be quite vigorous. So at Banfi, we've always um, worked tremendously, um, a tremendous amount in the vineyard to control our yields, making sure the quality of our grapes are fantastic. <clears throat> it's naturally high in acidity and bone dry character with incredible minerality, which really gives Gavi the quality it has. I mean, it needs a warmer climate to ripen. That's why we don't see Gavi planted in um, Alba and Asti. It's just a little too cool in that continental climate there to fully ripen Gavi. Uh, about 90% of the world's production of, of Cortese is in um, Piemonte. Um, there's some production um, in Coli Tortanese and Ultrapo Pavese, but Cortese and, and Gavi are uh, synonymous for each other which ultimately finally brings us to the wine. Uh, Banfi has been making world-class Gavi for many years. And as mentioned earlier, we were pioneers in elevating Gavi to this interna international stage it has now. Um, we've always believed in making approachable wines for everybody, but with that being said, we've always wanted to highlight the incredible terroir that I just spoke about of Gavi in our wines. Um, so following a rigorous uh, selection of the Cortese grapes, we ferment um, in stainless steel at 64 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 days. This cool and gentle fermentation really allows to preserve the freshness and the subtle fruit aromas um, of, of the wine. And I really think what Greg said was right about kind of that almondy note in it too. I think that's a, a quality of Gavi that's frequently um, overlooked or missed sometimes, and it really is quite lovely. In addition to that, um, great citrus on the nose, um, apple, pineapple in the palate is just all about the freshness, beautiful backbone of acidity that is so inherent to the Gavi region and making it the perfect um, pairing for seafood. This is a great example of what grows together, goes together, local cheeses, and then of course, seafood from the not too far away uh, Lugurian Sea there. And um, yeah, so, I hope you all can grab a bottle of Gavi sometime soon, preferably the Banfi Principesa Gavi Gavi. But if you have any questions in the meantime, again, my name is Elizabeth and you can reach out to me at ebooth at banfi.com at any time. So thank you so much. Well done. Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, yeah, the Gavi is always a beautiful thank wine. You. Um, you know, Piedmont, as you pointed out, Piedmont, I think is it of the 20 regions of Italy, Piedmont is one of the five that are landlocked. And, yes, exactly, uh, the, it is landlocked, yeah the Gavi area is where it comes closest to the sea. So it's kind of very uh, it's close, nice. Have, you know, mm -hmm. Very close, still just a little strip of Liguria between you and the yep. sea there. Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So beautiful wine, nicely done. I've always found Gavi to be wonderful because it's very elegant as a, a cocktail wine, if you would, but it also stands up great to food. It's a, uh, it's a got great complexity behind it as well. So beautiful wine. Thank you. Great presentation. Uh, and that kind of wraps us up. If, uh, you know, I've, if you guys have any questions, our audience has any questions, I'd encourage you to throw it into the Q&A or the chat. Um, but I just want to say thank you on behalf of the Psalm Journal, Psalm Foundation, uh, National Geographic and New Sotheby's. Um, it's remember to get your essays in. Lynn, would you like to give us a little bit of reminder of the, uh, the ground rules? Sure, Lars. Uh, sorry, let me turn on my video here. So uh, we're going to send out the essay prompt in the next couple days. Uh, you'll receive it via email and you'll have until midnight on uh, August 17th to submit the essay. Uh, we'd like you to keep it to 500 words or less uh, covering some topic on, on what we've decided on. The uh, grand prize winner will get a check for $400 uh, sponsored by the Psalm Journal. And first and second place will receive a copy of the New Sotheby's Wine Encyclopedia uh, mailed to them. So feel free to reach out with any questions, but all the instructions will be included in the link that you'll receive in the next day or two. Thanks, Fantastic. Lars. Good luck, everybody. Write well, sharpen your quills, get the ink uh, rolling out there. And uh, thank you to all our brilliant representatives today who, who really showed us a lot about some exceptional sites. You guys were fantastic. Uh, and I'm going to invite everybody to join us again on September 14th, when we talk about balancing act and we talk about Chardonnay at its best. And we'll have a guest co-moderator, uh, Andrea Immer will be joining us uh, for Andrea Robinson. I'm sorry, I'm, that shows my age. Um, but Andrea Robinson will be joining us to talk about um, some of the, the beauty, the beauties of Chardonnay as a great varietal grown around the world. So thank you all very much. And we will see you next time signing off for Psalm Journal.